something must have come up in this place, right? It's not really. But I really do like to get out at Washington once in a while and meet with people like you, and, and especially to be in Florida. I mean, this is such a key state, and there's friends here, and so it's a very comfortable environment for me. And um, I think I've been a member of Pax Christi even longer than I've been a member of Network, so uh, I feel very um, at home here. And um, I think most of you were here this morning where we talked about the American Catholic Council, and um, it's just great to be talking about God, country, and the common good. And so I guess we did the kind of the Catholic part this morning, and now I'll do the American part a little more, and we'll kind of switch back and forth, and I think it'll be really good. Okay, so I'm going to be doing a couple of four sessions throughout this weekend, the two this afternoon. Um, the first one is called, What's Wrong with Our Government? There you go. <laughs> and um, I have my Washington perspective about what's wrong with our government, but I want to hear from people like you and other people around the country what you think. And uh, as I was listening this morning to the, about the American Catholic Council, they said, oh, they really focused on the positive. They said, oh, just let the old institutions die and don't argue with them and just focus on the positive and move forward. And I'm thinking, hmm, I was going to start with the negative. That's not going to work. But then somebody mentioned the word lament, and I thought, ah, this is what the prophets did. They first lamented and then moved on uh, and announced a new thing. So we're going to spend only maybe five minutes lamenting. So. Do we have a couple of things we can list up here? What's, what's wrong with government? What did, what did you come up with? Corporate control. Corporate control? You can buy your office. Money. Money? Okay. In politics? So these are all the things we expect our government to respect life, uh, not go to war, not be controlled by corporate. Um, so, but what's wrong? Why isn't our government living up to our... What's wrong with it? Too few choices. Can I call that engagement? Is that, would that be fair? Uh, lack of people engaged? And we're tied to the two party system. Ah, parties. You were talking about our concept of what government is. What is government supposed to be? Is it related to the common good? I think there's something in our constitution about that. All right, so we're probably going to, well, we might come back to these a little bit later, and we definitely will in the next session, because that's what we want to figure out what we can do about these things and, and make our government better. Um, and I guess the, the confluence, you know, we heard this morning about our church and some of these same things. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, the parallels, about how many of our institutions seem to be failing us yeah. at this time. And so the importance of we the people in a lot of these places are, is, is really important. So um, what I'm going to try to do for the rest of this session is give you a sense of uh, what's going on in the federal government. Network operates at the federal level, so I'll talk mostly about the federal government. And then maybe I can hear from you about your feelings about the state government, because those state governments are very important too. I really like the the logo that's on the on the top of the, for the uh, for this session here, and uh, this shows citizen engagement. And, and on the right side, it, there's a little list of things, all the things that government should be doing: education, healthcare, housing, jobs, environment, and then military is on there. But the box wasn't checked because on the other side, it says we want to cut the military. We got too much of that. So. I want to talk a little bit about what our government is doing now in the context of military spending, because most of the things that our government has been doing this whole year is fighting about what? The budget. What our government is doing right now, I don't know if you, can you read the green or should I use black? Can you read that? Okay. Okay, at this moment, and again for most of the year, um, Congress has one job that they have to do every year, and that job is to allocate the money for the different parts of the federal government. They're supposed to do that every year, and the fiscal year for our government starts on October 1st. 
So before October 1st, they're supposed to have all that money allocated for all the governments by October 1st. Okay, today is what, October 15th? And they haven't done that yet. So we started fiscal year 2012 without a budget. And it's not unusual. The past couple of years, Congress has just been arguing too much to even figure out how to do this. So um, the normal way that they do this is through appropriations bills. Are you familiar with that process? Appropriations is spending, allocating the money to the different departments. It's hard to spell when you're up here. Right? <laughs> so there's a series of appropriations bills that are supposed to be passed, and you know your basic government, you have to pass them in the House, and then pass them in the Senate, and then if they're different, you have to get together in conference and pass the bill, and then the President signs it. So that process has been very difficult for Congress to do, especially since the House is controlled by Republicans, and the Senate doesn't seem to be controlled by anybody these days. <laughs> so. Um, so the appropriations bills did not get done by October 1st, but they are working on them, probably not now because it's Saturday, but this, in this time period they're trying to work on these appropriations bills. And the ones that we care about are obviously the Department of Defense that funds the military. The ones that we at Network care about most, um, we try to look at the safety net programs, the programs that affect people who are poor. Those are mostly in the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, some are in the Labor Department, some are in the Agriculture Department where food stamps comes out of that, um, and education is another important bill. Okay, so since they didn't get that done by October 1st, uh, you hear sometimes about, well, the government's going to shut down if Congress doesn't do this. Well, how come our government didn't shut down? Stop gap, yeah, and this is called a continuing resolution. Okay, you, you guys are with me, you know the terms, okay. Continuing resolution, and that's a stop gap or a temporary short term, and what that does is extend current funding to keep the government agencies open until the appropriations bills are finished. So right now we're operating under a continuing resolution which expires on November 18th. So hopefully by then, uh, Congress will have these appropriations bills done. Now, they probably won't finish each appropriations bill in order to speed up the process. What they do is put a whole bunch of bills together. And if they put all the appropriations bills together in one bill, that's called an omnibus. And that means usually leadership is involved in this. That's why the rest of Congress is sitting around with nothing to do the leadership and maybe the heads of the certain committees negotiate behind closed doors and kind of figure out what all the funding should be and put it in one bill so they can expedite the process, have one vote, and hopefully get the House and the Senate to agree on it. It looks like they might not put everything together in an omnibus. They might put a few bills together in one bill and then a few more bills together and that's called, believe it or not, a minibus. <laughs> we'll have multiple minibuses instead of one big omnibus. So that's what we have to look forward to when we go back for the rest of October and uh, November to get these little minibus bills passed and we need to be lobbying to protect the programs that we want to keep funded in those bills. Now the other thing that's going on at the same time, have you heard of the super committee? What's that? I guess I should use black. <laughs> and what are they doing? Right. This is a committee of six Democrats, three from the House, three from the Senate, and six Republicans, three from the House, three from the Senate. Because apparently 535 people are just too many to get anything done, so they're not going to try it with 12 and see if they can come up with how to reduce future deficits. This is not about funding fiscal year 2012, which already started. This is about cutting the deficit in the future, 2013 and beyond, okay? Um, so how can we influence the super committee? You can sign up for Network's email alerts and we'll tell you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, what, what we've been doing is asking people to contact your own representatives and tell them to tell the people on the committee what we want for priorities. 
So can you imagine being on the super committee, being these 12 people, how many people must be lobbying them? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, but. Uh, so um, the super committee needs to come up with something by November 23rd. That's their deadline. And then they, they have to go through a process where they get it scored and approved and all that kind of stuff, turned into legislative language. And then it has to be voted on in Congress by, I think it's December 23rd. Congress has to vote, the full Congress. Or they don't come home for Christmas? No. Do you know what happens if they, either the super committee can't come up with something, can't agree, or if Congress doesn't vote on it? Well, what happens then? Cut across the uh, department. Cut across the, it's called sequestering. If you, have you heard that word? Uh, sequestering means cutting, basically. And it's across the board cuts. It's uh, military spending as well as domestic programs. So the idea was that they would come up with something that nobody would like, and that would give them an incentive to do something else. So that's kind of where we are with that. What should we do with the American Jobs Act? <laughs> Pass this bill now? Is that worth it? <laughs> Okay, so that's going on. Um, it failed a test vote in the Senate, and the House doesn't even want to bring it up. Probably they're going to break it up into pieces and try getting some stuff through that way. Everybody is campaigning for the next election, and the next election is how long away? <laughs> so a lot of the stuff that is getting up for votes is setting up the other party to look bad. And there's all this politicking going on to try to do set up campaign ads. So that's what we have to deal with. You never know if you're hearing something that's really true or they're just doing it for you know, political reasons. And the fifth thing, um, maybe that's, the fifth thing is in the category of what the government is not doing. And that is ignoring Everything else that's on this other list here, immigration reform, health care, climate change, there's nothing going on. So that's my perspective about what's wrong with our government. <laughs> okay, now, I, how many of you have seen a chart like this before that shows how big military spending is? A lot of you? Okay. So this makes it look really bad. Out of our total budget, uh, military spending takes more than half. Is that really true? Yes. Yeah? Well, the total budget? Discretionary. Ah, there's a word up there that we, people forget sometimes, discretionary. Do we know what that means? Okay, discretionary is, when I talked about the appropriations bills that Congress does every year, the discretionary piece is the part that Congress has some discretion over every year about what they can move around and fund. That's as opposed to mandatory spending, which are sometimes called entitlements, which they can't really change without changing some law. And that's why I wanted to show you these charts so you understand what that is. This is the discretionary part of the f budget. Uh, there's different ways of showing this. This one shows percents. And depending on who's doing this, you know, I talked about the different government agencies. They group them together in, in different ways. So the rest of these little slices may show up a little bit different in some of these charts. And here's another example of that. It's grouped a little bit differently. And in fact, this one put Homeland Security in with military. So it came out even bigger. So there's a bunch of different ways. You'll see these charts in a bunch of different versions. In fact, there's one on the table back there that looks like this also. Um, but the numbers may be a little bit different, and the pie slices may be a little bit different depending on how they grouped it. But that's, again, discretionary budget. This is the total budget. And you can see in the total budget, here's defense over here, and it's only 20%. The big part is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. So I wanted you to understand this because when you're talking to people about the military budget, they're going to say it's only 20%. Yeah. Yes. This is why oh, yeah. there's some truth in that. OK, discretionary on this chart is these two slices here, the defense and the non-defense appropriations. Yeah, the wording is, is not consistent. Sorry about that. So these two pieces of the budget are discretionary. 
The rest of it's mandatory. Interest on the national debt has to be paid. Congress doesn't have any discretion over that. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid have to be paid. And then there's a group of other entitlement programs, um, which actually, food stamps comes in there. There's some good things in there. And I think there's um, like pension programs and some of the farm subsidies. Congress tries to get things in the mandatory side of the budget so that it doesn't get cut. Has anybody ever seen this, something called a unified security budget? I think this is kind of interesting. There's a group uh, that started doing this a couple years ago and they said, let's look at our total security budget. Um, and to them, that's not just military. Um, they they t put it in categories of offense, defense, and prevention. Because we need to do all of those things to be secure. Okay, so offense is, on the bottom there, the uh, military budget, which is about 700 billion, the big piece. Defense, they categorize as homeland security, that's defending our homeland. And that's about 50 billion. And then prevention is the diplomacy and development would be preventing conflicts around the world. And that's even a little bit smaller than homeland security, that's about 45 or so. So this group is proposing, and I think I gave, on the back of the year, where the budget charts are, um, I think there's a web, websites on there where you can get more information on this. Because I think this is a, in maybe a new way to talk about military spending, where we're talking about security spending. Everybody likes to talk about security. And say, well, how do we, how do we spend for security? Is it all, is the 700 billion that we're spending for offense really making us secure? Shouldn't we be spending more in defense and prevention? Especially the prevention part. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is a way to show how out of balance our security spending is, which I thought might be interesting for you. I think it's a kind of a new way of thinking about it, maybe talking about it. Yeah, John. The, our recent vote in Congress to reduce fundings to the UN, which obviously is prevention, mm -hmm. Is that factor, how does the UN's contribution fit in the budget? I think that comes out of the State Department budget. So, um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say if you're going to, what we're trying to do is get our troops out of Iraq, but they still, and Afghanistan, but they still want to do development in those countries to make it a stable country. So that's supposed to be up to the State Department. But somehow the military keeps getting the funding. So one of the things we're trying to do is say, the military is for offense. We want to do development and diplomacy. That should be in the State Department. We don't want people with guns doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> so that's one of the battles that, that we're fighting, is trying to get funding for the State Department to do its job. It, because the military budget is so big, it's just easy to throw more things in there. And there's a lot of things in there that don't belong there. So that's one of the little pieces that, that we're looking at at, at Network. Is it yeah. in our interest in common ground to begin to appreciate the concern that the entitlement is out of whack, or to at least ask that question? I think that's a good question to be asking ourselves, yeah. Um, and this is kind of what I want, we'll want to do more on that when we get into the other session about what we can do and how can we talk about this. But I think that's probably a good point. When you look at this, I mean, when you think of the number of people that get Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and what good programs they are, naturally we want to keep them. But that's the part of the budget that's been growing as we all age. <laughs> so, and, and that's, you know, when we talked about political parties, I mean, the Democrats are adamant about don't cut Social Security and don't cut Medicare. Well, <laughs> Maybe we have to not be so adamant, and that's what Obama tried to do, I think, is to try and, and balance a little bit. But, but you can't do that in an election year. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good uh, response to that, uh, because the health care bill that was passed last year was trying to, in fact, it's got a lot of things in there, to try and get the Medicare costs down. And they can do that because government has control over Medicare, so they can control the payments and, and how people are paid and all that. 
So that's why we need that health care bill, because it will bring total costs down, which will bring the Medicare, it, maybe not bring it down, but at least stop the exponential growth. Nancy. But now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Social Security is a program that we all have paid into right. while we worked that's right. in preparation for our retirement, right? Right. So. It, what, where does that money go? Well, it happens that our government has been dipping into those funds for other purposes. So in a way, they've taken the money that we've allotted for that for something else. Now, I don't see where they get, first of all, the permission to do that, and second of all, now the permission to just cut our benefits that we've been paying into. Yeah, Social Security is one other topic, but I'm um, glad you brought that up because I have seen versions of the chart that takes Social Security out entirely mm -hmm. because it's a trust fund and it's self-financed. Um, you realize, of course, that you're going to get, if you live to be a normal life expectancy, you will get a lot more out of Social Security than what you paid in. <laughs> um, it was meant to be a social insurance program. Yeah. So. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefit. Mm -hmm. Spending money that didn't need to be spent in the first place to destroy things and then go back and rebuild them. Yeah, and that's why I think this chart is interesting. Because that 20%. Well, 87% of that 20% is spent on wars and occupying other countries and weapons. Is that what we want? Or do we want our people to be healthy and secure in their old age? Actually, the, the argument in Washington right now is not really between entitlements. Nobody wants to talk about those. They know they can't do it in an election year. The Republicans tried, and they got a big backlash saying, don't cut my Medicare. Um, so the argument now is between is really looking just at the discretionary, the defense versus all these other things, that a lot of which are safety net programs. Um, the big money, it turns out, is in military pay and health care, uh, especially health care, because once you're a vet, anybody here a veteran? Do you get veterans health care? They got aircraft carriers. Even uh, Gates said he could cut down from 11 to 10 aircraft carriers, and they got all kinds of ships and weapons and planes and all kinds of stuff. So there's big money there that people think can be cut. And these are people who you know, are familiar with the military procurement and uh, nuclear weapons, of course, that would be one that we'd advocate for. Uh, reducing the troops in Europe and Asia, again, reducing the number of troops. I think you'd have to, in order to save money though, you'd have to reduce them in the US too. Don't just bring them home because it costs money to <laughs> still keep them home. When they're in Europe and Asia, the Europeans and the Asians pay for some of the, their housing. But. Does the redu reduction of troops include closing bases? Probably not. Yeah, that would be the, in Europe. In Europe. Well, and again, Barney Frank says, well, Barney Frank, the congressman from, from Massachusetts, yeah. said, they don't even talk about TRICARE. You're not going to cut veterans' health care. That's politically not possible. But I just want to say that it comes up because there's big money there. Um, reducing troops in Europe. Uh, you can't close bases in the U.S. because they're in some congressperson's district, but there's no congressperson's district in Europe, so it might be easier to close those bases. <laughs> See how that works? Um, RDT and E, that's research, development, test, and evaluation. There, a lot of people think we can cut money from there. And missile defense. And I thought I had one more on here. I guess I don't. Um, the V-22 Osprey comes up on everybody's list. The people who don't want to cut the military, these are the things that I keep hearing, is it's a risk to U.S. security. That's, you know, the biggest one. Uh, especially in an unpredictable global environment with the Arab Spring and Israel and Palestine, and we never know, we know what's going to happen. Some people think that China is going to be a threat because they're growing and they're probably going to grow their military. Um, some people say, oh, well, Obama and Gates already cut the military. We can't do any more. In fact, that's what Panetta is saying. They didn't really cut anything. They just st slowed the growth and moved some things around a little bit. Uh, jobs, I have, um, yeah, I think I have a handout on the table from a group. I think I got that from WAND also, but uh, there's a website on the handout. 
that uh, talks about per billion dollars of government money spent, how many jobs are created in the military and military contracting sector, and how many more jobs could be created in education and healthcare and things like that. So um, you're going to hear that as you know, military are good paying jobs. Well, yeah, that's why we're spending so much on them. But if we paid a little bit less to some of these other people, we could create a lot more jobs in total and put more people to work. Um, and then I read an interesting one that um, I mentioned before that the military budget is so big that it's easy to put other things in there. I found out there was even research funding for cancer in the military budget. OK, so the defense research and development budget, well, they're the ones that brought us the internet. That's a good thing. And they are very conscious about energy. And in fact, the military is very conscious of climate change because they see that as a security threat. Right. Right. Yes, they are. Uh, so in some cases, the people in the military are more aware of what's going on. And they might be doing some good. <laughs> Just an interesting thing.